Hey everyone, this is Nick, and this time again, we have so much good stuff to cover in this Linux and open source news video that I didn't even know in which order to put each topic. Hell finally froze over as Nvidia open sourced parts of their drivers for Turing and Ampere GPUs. China is moving 50 million PCs to Linux and provided you have a good enough internet connection, you can now play Fortnite on Linux as well. And there's Fedora 36, updates to GNOME, to KDE, to the Steam Deck, and a lot more. So let's talk about Linux, and let's talk about today's sponsor, which is going to let you get a free study on the state of security on Linux. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, but this time I'm not going to talk to you about their services to handle and manage your Linux server fleet. This time, they want you to take a look at a report that they sponsored about Linux security best practices. This research was conducted by the independent Ponemon Institute, and the results, which are freely downloadable, will let you benchmark your processes against a set of best practices. For example, research shows that organizations spend about 1,075 man-hours monitoring and patching systems each week including 340 hours of downtime to apply those patches. 45% of respondents also indicated that their organization has no tolerance for system patching downtime. Of course, that's a problem that Tuxcare solves with their live patching services, but if you want to learn more about Linux security best practices, how to implement them in your organization, head over to the link in the description below and download the full report for free. No strings attached. In a totally surprising, but totally welcome move, Nvidia just released an open source kernel module for their GPUs. It's a first step, and it's not the complete display driver for regular gaming GPUs, but it is still an amazing step in the right direction. This module won't be upstreamed in the Linux kernel just yet, as it currently doesn't conform to the kernel's design conventions, but they're willing to work on it. So basically, you will get NVIDIA drivers in the kernel, out of the box, in the future. They will accept user contributions on GitHub as well. Now, it's important to note that this driver will only support GPUs based on the Turing architecture and newer, so basically the RTX line. All the GPUs will still depend on the proprietary NVIDIA driver. For now, only the data center related parts are fully production ready. And for workstations and gaming PCs, the drivers are still alpha quality so we won't be able to make use of them immediately. All the user space components like CUDA, OpenCL, Vulkan support are still proprietary and will require a separate binary blob to work. It seems Red Hat has been working closely with Nvidia for years now to help prepare for this move, and developers for the Nuvo driver have also participated in meetings and code review, according to Christian Schaller, the desktop lead at Red Hat. One of the goals set for the future is also to try and get a single kernel driver for Nuvo and for the NVIDIA binary driver. So users of all the GPUs that can use Nuvo would have it right in the kernel and could use Mesa as the user space driver, and users of more recent GPUs would turn to the proprietary blobs that would interface with the kernel driver. One of the advantages we might also see down the path is a signed NVIDIA driver that would enable secure boot. It's an amazing move that I really didn't expect to see anytime soon or at all. Now, whether it's linked to devices such as the Steam Deck or to advances in machine learning and AI where Linux is the most run OS, or if it's those pesky hackers that just put all of this into motion, I don't really know. All I know is that it's amazing and it makes me super happy. You might remember that GNOME had to fight a patent troll a while ago in 2019. A company that can only be defined as a patent troll decided to attack the GNOME project for infringing on one of their patents, specifically on the way Shotwell, the photo manager, could be used to grab pictures from an external device, the way all photo managers have done for all time. The community had rallied around GNOME, donating around 150,000 US dollars, and GNOME settled the dispute, getting a complete free license to the patent for all open source software. But it turns out that this wasn't the end of the story, as McCoy Smith, a lawyer specializing in fighting patent trolls, asked the US Patent Authority to re-examine this specific one, which has since been found invalid. It's a pretty great move, and it might dissuade future troll companies to attack open source software on very vague claims. Now, software patents aren't a thing in France where I live or in the EU, 
And I think it's a good thing. Like patenting the way code works instead of patenting the code itself seems completely logical to me, but I'm not a lawyer. The GNOME developers published another weekly update packed with new stuff for GNOME apps. Characters, the small utility that lets you use special characters or emoji, now has support for composite emojis, which means it supports skin tones or gender modifiers for emoji that represent people or a body part. And it also now displays emojis in their correct order. There's a new app called Geopart, which lets you browse Gemini capsules. Gemini seems to be a project that provides another protocol to access content over the internet, like HTTP. Citations, the manager for BIPTEX references, also saw the light of day. And a new operating system installer was also released, soberly called OS Installer. It follows the GNOME Human Interface guidelines and it can be customized to be used by any OS. The blog post concludes with updates to Workbench, the Testbench and Sandbox for GNOME features, and a list of Linux App Summit talks, including the one on FlatHub I recommended last time. Very interesting stuff this time. I didn't know about Gemini, that protocol to access content over the internet, and I think having an OS installer designed with the GNOME HIG in mind might be a pretty good thing to have for Linux distros that ship GNOME by default. Of course, KDE developers won't let the GNOME devs beat them to a good weekly article, so they also have updates to share. Two of these pesky 15-minute bugs were solved, but two more were added, so the count still stands at 70. New features include the floating panels. It just lets you make your plasma panels float above the screen edge. It looks great, and while I wasn't sure that it would make it for the next plasma release, it seems that it will, which is good news. Discover also shows which resources will be accessed by various apps, so it's basically displaying all the permissions that sandboxed apps need access to. And you can also delete the settings and user data when uninstalling an app, something I wish GNOME software also did. Kate's menu has been rearranged to be less intimidating, more effects can be activated by swiping from the screen's edges, unlocking with your fingerprint is now more seamless, and you can scale icons up to 512 pixels in the file Open and Save dialogs. Good to see those floating panels making it to Plasma 5.25, and I also think the improvements to Discover are really nice. So I can't wait to test this new release of Plasma, it's going to be coming out next month, and I think it's going to be packed with interesting stuff to cover. The Chinese government seems to have decided to let Windows go in favor of Linux. They ordered government offices and state-backed companies to replace their PCs from non-Chinese manufacturers with alternatives built at home. And so they're on track to replace 50 million computers just in government agencies. This also means that Windows will be phased out for Linux, although there is no word on what exactly they will use. China being China, they'll probably use something they develop internally, or at least a distribution developed in China, like Deepin or Harmony OS, the distro developed by Huawei. They intend this plan to be carried out over two years, and it's been brewing for a long time, with traces of this decision going back to 2014. And it's very much the continuity of China's position on trying to be technologically independent from the West. I'm not sure this move will have huge impacts on the whole Linux community, as I'm certain that China will be very protective of their homegrown initiative or homegrown distro. But still, we might see some more contributions to the Linux kernel and applications, so we'll have to see. KDE Connect is now finally officially available for iOS devices, so you can integrate your Linux desktop with your iPhone and iPad. Previously, you could download a beta and try it out, but it's now a fully stable release, available to download from the App Store. It lets you do a ton of things, but not all features available in the Android client made it to iOS, since the platform is much more restrictive in what it allows apps to do. You can still share the clipboard between your device and computer, send files and URLs to your computer, use the device's screen as a virtual touchpad, use it as a remote control for presentations, and run commands from the phone to be executed on your computer. It will work with the KDE Connect app on KDE Plasma or the JS Connect extension for GNOME Shell. KDE Connect is an amazing tool and a much needed one if you often interact between two devices. And if you pair that with a syncing solution like Nextcloud, then you're getting dangerously close to what Apple provides in terms of device integration with iOS and macOS. Fedora 36 was released after being delayed twice. 
and promptly got installed on my desktop and my laptop. It brings with it GNOME 42 with better input latency and responsiveness under load, a ton of apps ported to Libadvita and the new GDK4 theme that comes with it, a new shell and the universal dark mode preference. Wayland is now the default for everyone, including Nvidia GPUs, although I faced a few issues on that front. There's also a new screenshot tool to record your screen and take, well, <laughs> screenshots, and GNOME Software's update interface now gives you more information. Text Editor is now the default instead of Get It, and there are plenty of under the hood improvements with DNF, the package manager, Systemd, and the Noto fonts, which are now used for more languages by default to have the best character set coverage possible. On my AMD laptop, Fedora 36 using Wayland has been a dream. I get awesome gestures, better battery life, better performance, everything is smooth and works nicely. On my desktop with an Nvidia GPU though, I had to revert to x.org as trying to record anything with OBS only gave me a black screen. Do you wish you could play Fortnite on Linux or the Steam Deck? Right now it doesn't work natively, although the game could run, because Epic decided not to include support for easy anti-cheat and Proton in their game files for obscure cheating reasons that always seemed weird to me. Well, Microsoft is coming to the rescue, assuming you have a good internet connection. Fortnite is now playable on Xbox Cloud, even without a Game Pass subscription. All you need is a Microsoft account and you'll be able to stream the game on any device, a phone, a Linux computer or a Steam Deck. As always, with Xbox Cloud, resolution might be good or bad depending on your internet connection and how far away you are from a server. On the Steam Deck though, it should look pretty good, as the resolution is already pretty low. Latency has never been an issue in my tests of that cloud gaming service, but again, your mileage may vary. All you need is Edge or Chrome and you're good to go. It's not the perfect solution to play a game, but it's still pretty good. If you have a Steam Deck, but are annoyed by the fan noise, you'll be happy to know it's an issue Valve is working on. The latest SteamOS beta tries to address the problem that stems from one of the two fan designs the deck is using. One of the manufacturers seem to be noisier than the other. What Valve is doing specifically is adding an OS controlled fan curve to improve the use of the fans in low resource usage scenarios and to adjust how the fan responds to temperature. They're also fixing an issue where that fan control would not resume after waking up the device from sleep. It won't make the issue disappear, but it should still be a little bit better. And still on the deck, there are now 2700 games that are verified, this time including Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, Merchant of the Skies, or Gods Will Be Watching. I don't know if I personally have the whiny fan on my Steam Deck, but the fan noise is definitely very noticeable when playing graphics-intensive games like God of War, for example. Now on top of that, the Steam Deck got another huge update to SteamOS. This time, it brings per-game performance profiles, which means that while you had to tweak the frame rate, the GPU core speed or the TDP every time you started a game to tailor the experience to each title, you now can either use a system-wide performance profile or you can save these settings per game, which means you won't have to redo all your tweaks every time you plan to play another game. The Steam hardware survey is also added to the deck, so people using the device can now report their usage and the Linux numbers should see a nice healthy rise. There are also performance improvements, fixes for the keyboard, and the recently played list now also displays games you've streamed from another device. That's a great update that will definitely make switching from game to game a lot easier if you want to have the best battery life possible. That's personally the way I play games, I have three or four at the same time, because my attention span is extremely low. Wine 7.8 was released, with the X11 and OSS drivers being converted to the PE executable format and adding WoW64 support in the sound drivers. As a reminder, WoW64 stands for Windows 32-bit on Windows 64-bit. It's basically the DLL that emulates 32-bit support for 64-bit systems and operating systems. So this move should make using a 64-bit prefix of Wine a bit better. 37 bugs were also fixed, including for games such as Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, Guilty Gear XX Reload, The Evil Within, Command and Conquer Generals, Adobe Lightroom 2.3 or Freehand 9. It might all seem pretty arcane, but the TLDR, 
or TLDW for video, I guess, is that it's gonna make gaming and running programs on Linux better. So it's all good. Just like today's sponsor, Tuxedo. These guys are based in Germany and they make laptops and desktops shipping with Linux pre-installed out of the box. They have a huge range of devices from the biggest gaming towers to NUX to gaming laptops to small ultrabooks to super nice 3K screens. They have awesome keyboards, all keyboard layouts. They can personalize your logo on the back of the device, which is always super cool. Basically, they have something for all price points and all needs. They just refreshed their Stellaris 15, which is their high-end production or gaming laptop, which I already reviewed the previous one on the channel. I found it super good in terms of chassis, of keyboard. It has an amazing screen. It's relatively lightweight for such a device. And I should receive the review you need for the new one pretty soon with my own logo engraved on it. And I might even buy it for my own needs. So if you need a new device from Tuxedo or just a device that runs Linux out of the box, Check the link in the description below, click it and see what they have to offer. I'm sure you'll find something you need. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, you can also dislike and tell me why in the comments below. And if you want to help support the channel, you can click that super thanks button down there and give a one-time donation. Or you can join my Patreon subscribers or my YouTube members and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!